Hello and welcome everyone to the Capital Mind podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit capitalmind.in and if you'd like to invest with us, do visit capitalmindwealth.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Mind may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 42 of the Capital Mind podcast. I'm Shrey Chandra and I'm here with the one and only Deepak Shunoy who's just back from Goa. He has a tan and he has a book coming out that's called Money Wise about investing and he's publishing that with Jagannath and you'll hear more about that soon. But we're not here to talk about the book today. Uh, on the suggestion of one of our Capital Mind PMS customers, we're here to talk about something I find super intriguing, P2P lending, and Deepak is very skeptical about this. So please listen in to today's episode if you want to find out about whether P2P lending makes sense for you, whether you're a lender who wants to make money on this as an asset class, or you just want to help out some folks in need, if you're a borrower who doesn't like banks or can't get a loan elsewhere, or you just want to understand the space and see if there's anything about the future over here. So with that, welcome Deepak, and let me just dive into the first question. From a lender's perspective or from like a whatever so a person with money, what is P2P lending and why can't I just put my deposit in a bank which pays me a brilliant and exciting 3.5% these days? Hey, hey, thanks Ray and you know, great to be back on the show. It's uh, It's been a good time in Goa. It's been exciting, fun and uh, um, now back to the grind. We're actually, I mean, this whole concept of P2P lending uh, got me thinking about, you know, how P2P lending has come about. It's one of the oldest professions in the world, second oldest profession they say or third I guess, which is uh, uh, you lend people money because they need money, you have it and they'll pay you a little interest on the, uh, on the way back. Uh, now, P2P lending from a lending perspective, and that means you have money and you want to give it out to somebody, uh, is the is, is a concept of saying, listen, you are always lending. I mean, you're thinking about it as a fixed deposit, but actually you're lending money to your bank. Now, when you lend money to a bank, uh, they take the money and then they say, we'll give you a certain amount of interest. Now, what the bank does with it is not of your concern, but really what the bank does with it is takes your money and lends it out to other people. Those people have, uh, you know, they take the loans, they may be running it for a business, they may be a personal loan, it may be a housing loan. You don't care what that is. You're not exposed to that part of the equation. You say, well, you know what? Uh, I'm giving the bank some money. I am going to get some money back from the bank. It's very straightforward. The bank is, in fact, the arbiter of this loan. However, they uh, stand guarantee in the middle. In the sense, if the person that they have lent to does not pay them back, the bank says, well, if he doesn't pay me back, I will still pay you back from my own money. So that's effectively what the bank is saying. So your, your counterparty exposure is to the bank, not to the end person who borrows from the bank. So if there's a theft in a bank, uh, you don't stand to lose any money. Uh, I mean, at least to the extent that the bank can repay you, it will, it will have to repay you. And uh, banks have other guarantees and necessities and all that stuff. Now you say, well, you know what? What does the bank get when it does this? Well, it gives you a fixed deposit and you get 6% on your money. You However, wish, probably less than well, that less these than days. That. I mean, it's <laughs> wishful thinking, but you know, the issue with um, uh, banks is that when they when they uh, they have other sources of uh, being able to borrow, and so therefore those sources, other sources of being able to borrow, are actually so uh, giving the money at such cheaper rates. They've been cutting down the rates they can offer you as a borrower because they're saying, listen, if I if you if I have to give you seven percent, I have other sources I can borrow at five percent, five and a half. So maybe five five and a half is what I'll offer you as well. So now. Uh, since the bank is offering you five, five and a half, uh, you must be thinking, well, you know what? Then if I go to the bank and apply for a loan, I should be able to get what? Six, seven? I mean, how much does the bank need? The answer is banks keep a huge spread, typically four or five percent in India, sometimes higher. So you go to a bank and you say, I want a loan. They'll say, I'll give you the loan at 10 percent. Uh, the minimum spread that they keep between borrowing and lending rates is 2%. So the difference between what you can get from a bank and what your you may have to pay a bank for an interest is roughly 10%. Uh, sorry, is it roughly 2%, uh, the minimum. And usually the spreads are 4 5 or 6%. That means you may be giving the bank money, the bank's taking your money and giving it to somebody else and earning 4 or 5% in the middle. This sounds like a lot of money. I mean, if you're giving me at six and you're keeping four for yourself, 
I make six, you make four. You're making like three fourth or two third what I make. Um, uh, just and it's not even your money as a bank. So w- what what are you doing in this whole space? It is of course your standing guarantee. Then you can say, well, I'll I'll do one thing. I'll go to a different form, and a different forms exist. So for instance, you can go give your money to a debt mutual fund. A debt mutual fund effectively loans money. to other uh, companies large companies alliance lic housing finance all of these uh, different companies that exist which issue bonds or nc non convertible debentures we have talked about this in one of the other podcasts as well now when you give your money to a mutual fund and it on lends that money to one of the corporates uh, you now the corporate may be paying 7 or 8% uh you will get that 7 or 8% minus the management fee of this mutual fund which typically it ends up is between 0.5 and 1% so roughly well much lower than what the bank was charging in that charging case, you yeah. charging bank was charging you 4% yeah. this guy yeah. is charging you 0.5 to 1% what's the key difference over here and we've seen this play out in say the DHFL case and a bunch of others is that your money is when it is on lent onwards to somebody else uh you bear that risk so if dhfl didn't pay back and your mutual fund held dhfl you take a loss uh, it may be only 5% of that fund so that you may out of the 100 rupees you given the mutual fund you may lose only 5 rupees but you still lost the money and the mutual funds themselves want you not to lose money so they try to lend it to the most credit worthy borrowers but sometimes they make mess mistakes up. Yeah. well i mean yeah it's a part of the game right so it's but unfortunately um, um we've had too many mess ups in the recent past however uh, this is fairly common that you know people in ex- in extenuating circumstances can't pay back corporates cannot so that bankruptcy hit uh, hits you straight so the mutual fund is not exactly an arbiter it is just an intermediary that kind of routes your money straight through and because it does that they have to reveal exactly who they have lent money to on a monthly basis so that uh, you know you because you are bearing the risk it makes sense that you should um, know who your lent money is being go- uh, lent to so this was great fantastic you have gone to companies however companies are not the only people who borrow now you are thinking if i go to a bank i borrow um why can't someone lend to me directly and get rid of the bank in the picture why should i pay a bank 10% when the bank is paying someone else only 6% can't i make a deal with that end person it's almost like saying i am buying a fruit for uh, 30 rupees a kg and a farmer is selling the same fruit for 10 rupees a kg so why don't i go to the farmer and offer him 11 rupees a kg won't that be better for him it's better for me and we just get rid of the middleman and this is exactly what p2p lending is and instead of you lending to a corporate Uh, through a mutual fund you are now lending directly to another individual or the other end the difference between the two is this mutual funds can't lend to individuals mutual funds can only buy securities of corporates and they have to be rated and all sorts of things so uh, you're not going to compete with a mutual fund but you're competing with another bank a bank can lend to an individual however you directly can lend to an individual so why would you do this in the first place the first answer should be obviously listen if i'm lending to another person on the other end um there is a uh, there is a risk that i assume now this risk can be uh, known so for instance if i lend to a friend uh, i have a rough idea of that he will pay me back or he will not pay me back or she will uh, return the money in one year or two years or five years Uh, and i can have some kind of a control over the process because i can call them up and say listen i need some money uh, you've taken 1 lakh rupees from me can you return 10000 at least and they will say okay or not okay or so on so this this risk is known and then there is unknown risk where you say listen i don't know who the end party is i've put this money like in a mutual fund you don't have any control over who the end so you could do this concept of saying i may not know the person because everybody i know already has money why don't i lend to people that i think need money and are willing to pay an interest for it and um, that uh, can be for instance you hear of people pledging their gold uh, for 29% a year you say wait 29 no 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 i don't want 29 i can do it 20 to 21 yeah i might and, be able to do that know, yeah. so you, you 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 can say that and say yeah. uh, why don't i lend to these people? i don't know who these people are but if they're getting to, if they're paying back loans at 29% i'll give them 21% instead so that is something that's another reason why you might think it's it's useful for me to lend to uh, someone else now um, 
the problem that you should think of um, uh, as 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 uh, somebody you don't know borrowing money from you is that uh, some there's a lot of work in finding out who this person is they, you know it's like oh is this person credit worthy enough have they taken loans from other financial institutions uh, uh, how has their past repayment been um, now uh, you could do you know gold collateral but in in this specific case, we talk about P2P lending. You can't do any collateral, but we'll come back to that. So money lenders do uh, P2P lending, usually with collateral. So they are people with money in a village. And people come to them and say, well, you know, and, you know, in in, in a lot of uh, places, um, factory owners where who, who to, for their own suppliers, they become uh, suppliers maybe, say, if you're doing garments, for instance, they, the factory owner will say, I'll lend you some money. You can buy the garment, you can stitch it and come to me. Eventually, I'll process it. But uh, for the working capital, you take finance from me and I'll charge you 24% interest. So there, this is P2P lending with a much granular, more granular control over this entire process. However, um, this is uh, that might people have, you know. That might have higher margins than the governments. Um, Maybe. Possibly. In fact, Maybe. a lot of times, uh, you know, the issues that people face in a money lending situation uh, causes them to believe at some point that the money lending itself is a bigger part of the operation than the you know actual factory itself. Uh, but without the factory, they will not have any reason to lend money. So sometimes the factory is run for the purpose that, oh, listen, I'll process the shirt you give me, but really you have to pay me that 24%. This cynical start to our podcast. Uh, yes, <laughs> it is. It sounds like a, a little bit of wayward or a different path, but you know, it's, it's very interesting because the financial models kind of lead into the, each other. Um, but sorry, coming back to where we are, uh, Think of the P2P framework as um, there is a more professional framework, right? So now you say, okay, uh, Shrey wants to lend to somebody. He doesn't know who this somebody is and uh, he needs to get to know some standard parameters like have you got a loan, extra. What if there was someone in the middle and we'll call them the P2P company? This P2P company says, listen, I will find out about... Uh, everything about the customer you need to do. So I'll, I'll get 100 people and I'll organize them in terms of their uh, credit scores and their past loans and their historical repayment rates and why they want the loan and all of that stuff. You can come in and, you know, think of Tinder for finance. You look at each of these borrowers, you swipe left if you don't like it, you swipe right if you do, uh, and you choose to lend out. And the difference over here is, uh, it's granular and think of it as a tokenized lending in the sense that if a person wants 1 lakh rupees, you're not paying full 1 lakh. You're saying, listen, I will give you 5,000. But you may have, say, 3 lakh rupees to lend. So you're going to choose like maybe 50, 60, 70, 80 people to be giving that money to. One person you give 5,000, one person you give 10,000 and so on. So you are never 100% of a person's loans and 100% of your loans don't go to one person. And one person also gets money from a lot of other people. There's a reason for this diversification. So the idea being that, you know, one person defaulting doesn't hurt you so much. It's, it makes sense from a lender's perspective that you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. Uh, so therefore, you diversify. So this P2P company sits in the middle between you and somebody else. And you have, it doesn't take any risk, just like a mutual fund. It just gets you the information. You make the decision to lend. And um, it always exposes you to any changes of behavior of that end customer by, by saying, listen, he's not repaying. They'll collect, they actually collect the repayments and then pay it onwards because now they're collecting one repayment for the customer, finding out who all, who, which other people have lent that person money and uh, giving them back their money in the kind of proportion that they've borrowed it at. Now, uh, you have a problem in that if there is a default, it's entirely on you. Maybe this is where I'll step in a bit. So you had asked me to look up where P2P lending was in India. And I read some articles from just earlier this year. So they mentioned two fairly big names. There's a large company called Faircent. Uh, there's another one called Lenden Club or Lenden Club. Not sure which one they were going for. And the numbers look pretty big. I think this was Business Today or something like that. And they were saying like, I think the, the uh, Faircent, which was apparently the first one to get like this uh, P2P NBFC license, it has something like 2 lakh lenders and uh, 23 lakh borrowers, which is pretty huge. And same article, so over a thousand crores in loans dispersed uh, last financial year or this current financial year and a loan book that's almost twice that size. 
uh, you were asking about the global number and it's it was nearly 100 billion again not sure whether it was the loan book or amounts dispersed but it's pretty large either way as a, almost as an asset class uh, and that to a fairly nascent one or a nascently formalized one um but one thing which kept coming up in these articles which was your point around defaults is that uh, i mean this is just how people sort of have a rule of thumb to understand it is that if you're lending money out at say i don't know 15% but there's a default rate of 10%, well, then you'll end up with 5%. That makes some intuitive sense to me. But when I said that to you, you were a bit skeptical and you said the math doesn't always work out. So, uh, what's the deal there? Uh, well, yeah, I think the problem here, Shrey, is that the way it's put, it sounds correct. And uh, the law of large numbers is that the math that works at small numbers works very badly at large numbers. I'll give you an example. The example that you mentioned was, um, I, I lend 100 rupees, I charge a 15% interest rate. So if everybody repaid me, I would get back 115 rupees. Now, what if I have a default rate of 10%, which means I did 10 rupees defaulted. And this 10 rupees did not pay any interest either. So technically, I have 90 rupees that repaid me. So if 90 rupees gave me 15%, it's 103.5 roughly. So my 100 became 103.5. It didn't become 105. And let me, uh, it is exaggerates itself even further at higher interest rates. So let's say you charge 20%, but you have a 15% interest rate. A default rate. Default rate. 15% default rate. Now you might say, listen, I should make the difference. Which is, uh, which is In actuality, you're making 2%, yeah. not 5 So at higher default rates, uh, the numbers uh, go even more crazy. And um, at smaller interest rates, it makes sense. I'll give you an example of the small, interest rate, uh, small default rate. So for instance, I'm charging 12%. I have a 1% default rate. So... What happens now is instead of 100 rupees giving me 112, 99 rupees gives me 111. So I, yes, I make that, uh, you know, A minus B only in cases of really small interest. But at larger interest rates, things go completely bizarre. I'll give you this. At 30% interest rates, at 30% interest rates, you roughly have to make charge an interest rate of um, 30, well, uh, 70 rupees has to become 100 just to make you break even. That right? sounds like almost 50%. 70, that's almost 50%. That's about 40, 40%. Nearly, well, 40% plus. So, you're talking of charging 40% rates if there are 30% default rates. That just means charging percent yeah. interest has to be charged if you're expecting a 30% default rate. And you think of, uh, you're looking at me and saying, Deepak, 30% default rate is obscene. But in our conversations with the people we've talked to, They've told us that, listen, 30% default rates are common. So that means if I lend a lakh of rupees, I can expect that 30,000 of it will go under um, default. That means um, if you look at some of the, and I think we did the math also. So we looked at, uh, was it uh, Linden Club, I think? Um, uh, it it was it was complicated because they said only 1% or 2% or 3% or something defaults. But in actuality, the numbers were much higher. Um, well, I guess it, it default is, uh, uh, as their site made clearly, default is a technical term. And so when they said that there's a default, they, they had some like uh, math to, and they showed you the numbers to justify it. But then you used a slightly more rule of thumb framework to be like, look, on your own data, you have, I don't know, remember which site this was actually. Yes. I but think uh, uh, you had used a rule of thumb to say, look, if it's past 30 days due, past 60 days due, I would have considered this a default. So yeah, but I, I mean, guess, if somebody hasn't paid you for 60 days, if you're, and you don't have any collateral, now P2P lending in India says the P2P player cannot take any collateral. So you as a lender, a borrower cannot, does not have to give collateral and should not give collateral. And the lender cannot take any collateral. So it's not can't be gold-based finance and all that stuff. So here's the interesting thing. If there is no collateral and someone hasn't paid you for 60 days, chances are they will never pay you. Um, and you know, if, especially if they promise to pay you and they haven't paid you. But, so if you take the 60 days past due of almost all of these companies. It was almost double digits or higher, whereas the yes. reported default rates were lower. So as I said, they, they clearly have, I mean, no one is violating any laws here. So they're very pretty careful about what their default rate is and what that uh, and how they justify that. But I get your point. Yes. And you know, and the other thing that happens is companies have vintage issues. When I say vintage issues, I, I'll give you the uh, things. For instance, if you have a highly fast growing business, and I'll give you DHFL as an example, because that was a lender that did uh, uh, go under. Uh, if you're growing very fast at 40, 50%. Now, if I have 100 rupees worth of loans this year, 
I have given a hundred rupees worth of loans. Um, and uh, in the subsequent year, uh, I give another fifty rupees worth of loans. Now I have a hundred and fifty rupees worth of loans outstanding. Of the first hundred, I have a default rate of say fifteen percent because the first uh, set of loans has defaulted. Now the second set of loans has not yet defaulted as well as the. So what has happened is my hundred rupees of loans has become. I now have. I look at it as an aggregate. I say this. Now I have one hundred and fifty rupees worth of loans landed out. And only fifteen. But only fifteen has so defaulted. So only ten percent. So the fifteen percent default rate on the first vintage. Is now a ten percent default rate okay. on the longer okay. term mortgage. Okay. Now you do the same math and say that the guy is growing thirty percent a month, and in three months he is now at hundred k has become two hundred and fifty k of lending, but the first vintage has defaulted twenty five percent. Now you are thinking, you know what? What what that means? I have lent to such lousy borrowers that they start defaulting after a three or four months. They pay me back for three or four months, and after that they default. If you look at that and you say that give me a loan uh, default rate by vintage, tell me loans given in twenty nineteen. Yeah. Uh, what are they? How? What is the default rate today? Uh, loans given in twenty twenty. What are the default rates today? You will see the numbers cross twenty twenty five percent in a lot of cases, especially in P two P. Now we've had a crisis in the middle. Yes. Uh, but. In even then, I would say that the numbers reflected really bad repayment rates even before this, and growth has masked a lot of I get this. Your point. Uh, so they look at you and say four percent. In four percent, actually means seven, uh, which could actually mean fifteen. I mean, you don't know what the numbers mean because you don't know how much growth has happened in the last few years. So there were people in the in the public market space who would who would actually say, "Listen, let me eliminate the growth of the last one year." And then look at your default. and then look at your default numbers as a percentage of last year's uh, numbers because it's unlikely that the loans that you gave in the last one year have a significant default rate. So it's possible that the loans before that were. So if I look at those numbers, is, is your NPA number very high? So high growing companies typically the default rates are understated. Um, so that's which is problem. pretty much everyone in the space. So right yeah, now. and and yeah, right now you know it. everybody saying it's a hot space, so they just grow and. I won't say that any of the players are doing this, but think of a player that is funded. If it had to bring down the default rates, it would just lend money to I somebody can. and he would repay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I find someone I know, I can say I'll lend it to you, I'll repay. You lend it to you, I'll repay. Then my total overall lend lending lended lent amount. And the repayment of that and the default rate of that, the percentage comes down. However, it still means that people who have actually borrowed money from me, which is not this shady borrow and lend back, uh, are and I, I won't say that this happens. I'm just saying that since this, since I have determined that this is possible, um, and in India generally everybody wants the you know fake it till you make it concept. The fake it will happen. It's not that you know it won't. So unless you're a you're an investor in these companies, you would have actually no idea that this is happening or not from the outside. So if you're an investor in these companies, in the sense you have given, you want to give them money, you can't even ask for these metrics. And I unless tried. you're unless you're an investor, unless you're like you know you've you're a VC fund that has okay. given money to this company. If you're a lender to these companies, they're looking at you and saying, "Listen, you want to lend, you lend. You don't want to lend, go away." Because I'm giving you like thirteen percent interest rates and so on. So this default rate has a big uh, bearing, uh, effectively, on the rate that you should be charging. To give you an example, like I said, if I want to make five, if I want to make ten percent. And my default rates are also ten percent. So that means if I want to make my hundred has to become one hundred and ten, um, and if my default rates are ten percent, what is the interest rate that I should be charging? I want to make ten percent net. Um, well, then ninety needs to become one hundred and ten. Ten, yeah, which is twenty two percent. Quite a so bit. So I yeah. need to be charging twenty two percent for me to make ten percent. So that's the that's the kind of uh, numbers you're looking at. And default rates of under ten percent are unheard of in this industry. Uh, well, I mean, they're heard of. They're it's just like you disagree with them. I mean, you disagree with how you define them. Yeah, point, yeah you know, so. okay. Well, let's go there. Let me tell you a bit about how. I mean, uh, some other things I figured out about how the RBI and other people sort of make you get diversified. So, if you're an investor, uh, you're only allowed to put fifty lakhs in total in this. So, to some extent, you're you're you're, you're capped, and that's an interesting point because that's how much you need for a PMS as well. I just realized. Additionally. Um, 
you can't give more than 50000 to one person so if you if you're if you're doing 50 lakhs and you and you want the minimum number of people you need to lend out to is 100 sounds reasonably diversified to me and look i wanted to play devil's advocate here many of the criticisms you've raised i completely get it it's it's very intuitive and and, and uh, I, i i'm sure there'll be some pushback but people say this about stocks and pmss and aifs and well maybe not mutual funds but folks in the stock market as well right that look you're saying your return is this much but there's vintage there as well uh i want to know what your return is but you're not telling me who lost money and who made money so there is uh, if i may say the criticisms you've leveled against p2p lending as an industry don't they also apply to the industry where current one of the industries we're in right now as well in fact not only that is does it apply i think the regulators have recognized that it applies and asked people to make standardized uh, dick disclosure so for instance as a pms still a while back sebi said just tell us the overall return that you've given your customers now they said oh you can't you know what you have five different strategies so you guys need to do time weighted rate of return exclude the cash component and tell us or oh, sorry include the cash component that means you can't just tell me you've invested 10 rupees out of 100 and then show me the return of that 10 rupees so in give give the whole uh, numbers use a time weighted rate of return calculation and use that as the return metric that you're going to demonstrate to your customers um they've done this for mutual funds where the mutual funds have a specific kind of way they have to show in fact to the extent that a mutual fund buys a bond it can't decide if the bond uh, is valued at 90 or 95 or 100 there's a matrix that comes from crisil which you have to use in order to determine how much that bond is worth um because um, people who pick because, a bond always think it's worth more than yeah, what the market I mean, says you could yeah you tell me i love dhf and right? i don't care if it's defaulted i think i, I mean i know these guys i know they'll return my money and sure. so i'll market it at 100 you could you could do that in the past because sebi recognized that listen i don't trust you and you know what you're wrong so they since they are since they have said that they have established certain rules and credibility on valuation they haven't done this for p2p loans for instance p2p loans are considered bad uh, npa only if they go beyond i think 90 days 91 days in fact sebi requires you to uh, sorry rbi requires you to disclose loans which are more than 360 days i'm like dude 360 days it's gone it's finished the guys nobody is going to give you back money after 360 days in fact after 90 days also it's very peculiar so reporting standards which are applicable to financial institutions who typically take collateral have other ways of collecting payment should be more tight for uh, p2p lenders but you're right in the sense that we actually have um uh, the criticism or uh, that applies to uh, you know uh, uh, the pms and the mutual fund providers uh, is 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 also Uh, uh being addressed by regulation and i think in p2p also it's get it's it slowly it will really get addressed by regulation however i think there's one point that you make that you have to be uh, careful about in a debt based lending framework your upside is capped if you get 13% that's all you get yeah. uh on the downside you lose 100% uh in stocks the downside is 100% of course because you could lose all your money but the upside is not limited to 10% or 13 it's like upside could be anything it could be 300% and this is why uh, in stock markets people make money is that you get a few stocks that give you more than that 100% and those stocks pretty much mean the bulk of your returns and you know what if you look at any mutual fund if you look at any large investors portfolio you will find that one or two stocks account for like 80% of their returns or maybe three stocks the reason for that is because they've just held those stocks on so long and it's it's wiped away the sins of all of their Mistakes. losers yeah. uh, which is similar to vintage wiping away sins of the past however uh, in the vintage problem you're just postponing the problem to tomorrow by hiding the data because newer vintages haven't defaulted yet whereas in stocks growth is real so um in the sense that if a stock price has gone up it could be sold on any day for that price that's why it's gone up so much or that's how you define the concept of it going up so much so i think um uh, while the regulation while the while the concepts are similar this upside capping kind of keeps you keeps p2p lenders at a much more disadvantageous position compared to most other higher uh, uh, risk and higher reward instruments okay now l- let me weigh in on that with a few questions so look if you look at the market right now let's say someone came and gave you several crores of revisions at deepak congratulations here you up you look at the stock market and what well, it's been running uh, other than the last couple of days it's been running up insanely for a year you look at fixed deposits they're like nothing savings bank accounts give you barely anything those bond funds we used to like those psu and banking they're like low single digits as well or or just just north of 5 so p2 
P2P lending, I go to the websites, I see 13 to 25 percent. That sounds pretty good to me. So can you tell me, how am I getting 13 to 25 percent? Who are the people on the other side of this? And uh, I mean, you you mentioned in right now that there isn't collateral like gold loans. You, I think maybe now is a good time to bring that in. And how do you weigh in on the fact that some prominent startups recently have, while launching this initially, said, you know what, either implicitly or explicitly, they're like, we're going to try and make sure this is a success and curate people or make sure that you don't lose money. I mean, or obviously not in such words, but I've tried to uh, put a positive and I think genuinely helpful spin on it. So where do you stand on all of these questions I raised here? Yeah, this is actually quite, you know, I think the first part of it is is um, is, is interesting in the sense that there are, you know, there are other risk instruments as well to invest in. So why a P2P or why, why does not P2P not look as attractive as any of them? Um, I think... One of the things that happened uh, in the recent past, we saw in Franklin, in UTI, a uh, number of debt funds are also risky. They've invested in re- debt that was risky and their repayments uh, got halted in Franklin and very delayed. In UTI, there was actually a loss taken by the mutual fund. There was uh, There is a bunch of these things that have happened in the mutual fund way uh, also, but there are lots of standards and rules. So for instance, a mutual fund, when it lends to a company, they can be collateral against that lending. A bank, when it lends to a person, can take a house as a collateral as a or uh, as a collateral or uh, a car or gold or anything like that. The problem that microfinance players and uh, P2P players have, uh, it's the end person is a, uh, end user is a person who does not have to give collateral. In fact, it's mandated that P2P lending cannot take collateral, which means you cannot secure your loan against anything. You have to secure your loan against the person's credit worthiness and the capacity to repay, no, not the collateral. So you're missing one of the three C's of lending. You don't have collateral, you have, capa- you have capacity and credit worthiness. Uh, individual credit worthiness can vary quite suddenly. I can be credit worthy. Suddenly, I get hit in an accident, I lose my job, I have no capacity to repay. My credit worthiness actually comes down quite substantially because now I'm not able to repay. My capacity drops considerably. So, And uh, because you don't have access to my assets, uh, you don't have any leverage uh, over me. The only thing you have a leverage over me is, as an NBFC, that you can, um, you can affect my civil report, saying that this person took a loan, from a, a person and then you know you you uh, you know he, he didn't repay and therefore for the next time i apply for a loan they'll say well you didn't repay that so your score has dropped so we won't give you a loan that's the only leverage they have but otherwise what you know a leverage do they have but you think of it from as a lender who is this person who's coming to a p2p player now if i have a house i'll use that as a collateral i'll get a loan at seven percent Uh, If I have a car, I'll get a loan at 10%. I can use my securities. Again, 10%, 11%, I can get a loan. Now, when you come to a P2P kind of company, you've pretty much tried these avenues and exhausted them or you don't have any collateral or they don't want to give, they're giving you loans at maybe 12, 13%. Now, the P2P player says, I'll give you a loan at 15. Now, the economics of it is in such a way that if uh, the P2P player is actually doing all this work collecting your information and all of that stuff they are um, they are they, they are saying listen 15% will be charged to the lender and then 2% the, will be kept by uh, the p2p player and uh, 13% will go back to uh, the borrower uh, the lender sorry the borrower pays 15 and the lender gets 13 um, now if you look at this this whole concept and say that the borrower is now paying 15% to come to something. This person has probably been rejected by the banks, rejected by NBFCs, does not have collateral, possibly does not have great credit worthiness either, and perhaps has a uh, you know score, a credit score which is not that great. Your when you lend to such a person, naturally your default rate has increased. Each of these parameters, no collateral, I have tried a bank, it hasn't come, has increased the potential for a default rate. Now, the higher your interest rate that you're charging, the more likely you're getting a person who's more likely to default, which means if I charge 15%, my default rates are 10. If I charge 20%, my default rates are not 15. My default rates are probably 18. So, my default rates increase more expo- exponentially as the rates increase and I don't have any collateral to show for it. So this is where the problem is of the two. Uh, if you find a bridge, the platform that can bridge the two, 
the gap between the two and uh, 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 give you you know good information that might be one of the ways to say well you know i'll participate but you know what most of these loans whether they're short term or they're long term they need to make you money in a in a longer period of time now you don't have the time if you're typically a working professional who says listen i'm not going to go through 100 150 set of people um before i uh, uh, you know for each loan for because i'm giving 1000 rupees per person i have 1 and 1/2 lakhs i can't go to 150 profiles so you know what you tell the platform i'll give you 150000 you find an algorithm i'll give you the parameters give me safe that means somebody has a credit score above 600 out of 800 uh, or out of 900 whatever the number is and w- you want uh, scores as high as possible uh, but the the minimum score i want to give it to is 600 and then just give it uh, give those people loans automatically now you've absolved yourself of the responsibility you've paid the p2p platform a uh, certain fee you're paying them the difference between the borrowing rate and the lending rate um, in order to make these loans and you assume the risk the problem here is if there is a if there is a default because you didn't make the selection yourself you feel a little cheated because you say listen i thought you checked everything and they say well we did because you didn't have the time but you i followed your parameters i did, did everything you did we did our best and you you feel more disappointed and you say well you know what help me recover at least no they say well, you know what uh, there's a legal charge of 40000 rupees says dude but i gave this guy 2000 rupees i'm not going to spend 40000 rupees to collect 2000 that's stupid uh, like well that's it what it costs if i need a legal notice but guess what i have 40 other people who have lent it so instead of paying 40000 rupees you pay 500 rupees now you're thinking to recover 2000 i have to pay 500 rupees and i don't even know if i can recover it because if this person has defaulted most likely he won't respond to a legal notice in the first place this makes you disappointed and also says listen i have so much more money in the system are they going to do this for every single loan that defaults to tomorrow is this the kind of uh, uh, stuff that happens when i default and people aren't get towards thinking screw this forget it i don't want it anymore now what is interesting about a platform like this is sometimes it can still help because you may um, and we'll come to that about why we should you know why you should or why you shouldn't but i think um, uh, some part of this platform can be uh, a form of charity and we'll we'll, we'll probably I'll pause you there that. because one thing you said you immediately struck me from a tax perspective so just let me talk to you through this and tell me if you agree i give you a loan you pay me back for the first year now there's an interest and a principal component so i i i pay tax on that but year two you're like sorry i've got hit by a bus i can't pay you back i'm done what about my loss and can i get back my taxes that i've already paid this is actually the elephant in the room and you know you hit it spot on because uh, you're an individual you're not a business well you can't be right you it's p2p i mean yeah, yeah. so because you because of this since lending is not your business um the lack or the the person who doesn't uh, uh, return the loan to you is not available to take as a loss for you for for some whatever reason it is apparently and so the issue with this is that for 2 years i could have lent 100 rupees got 30 rupees as uh, interest yeah the third year the guy defaults on the money yeah. or only 70% of the money comes back yeah. he says i have only 70 le lo yeah now you said okay you know what 70 plus 30 interest 100 that's fine i don't guess what tax, yeah. the problem is on the 70 loss you on the 30 profit the interest that you made you paid your taxes as in so you must have paid 10 10 rupees as taxes out yeah, of the 30 something like that yeah so you left with only 20 now he gives you back 70 70 plus 20 is 90 and you're thinking well, what happened to the remaining 10 the government took it but the 70 the, the money that you lost which was the 30 rupee principal that he couldn't repay you cannot offset that back against your tax so this is where uh, it becomes uh, horrible because you're at a position where if there are defaults you can't uh, uh, bear the yeah. you can't you can't offset the loss against the income you're making in the first place so this i think that is where there's a serious uh, uh, issue with the p2p uh, lending framework also but i mean let me come back to the other question you also asked uh, which was how are these players who are, uh, who are guaranteeing yeah. stuff or not uh, sorry not that's not the word who are putting their best foot forward and trying to help you get get your return uh, yes. yes so let me give you the i mean the, the thought process like this you see this ad great startup says give me money for p2p lending i have platform lot of people very interesting guys and all that so some of them are even going ipo but still uh, what happens over here is you say less you know if i am um, uh, if i if i give you money 
now why can't i give that person money and uh, because for them to take money there is something called a deposit they can't take deposits okay. as a company company deposits the new companies act has a lot of you know a lot of uh, curtail they curtail uh, for taking deposits from the general public the second thing is if they take money and lend it onwards they have to become an nbfc which many of them don't uh, a full fledged nbfc i'll tell you why that works okay so let's say you lend to a bank and the bank on lend to somebody else the bank takes the risk yeah. when the bank takes the risk the rbi says listen you're taking risk so i want certain capital buffers yeah, yeah correct so you for 100 rupees you have to have 10 rupees of your own money if you're lending 500 rupees you have 50 rupees of your own money so 10% capital ratios disclosures on npas this that everything so lots of regulation um now some of these startups don't want that regulation or simply um um I mean, um, becoming a bank isn't easy, right? And BFCs also you can either take deposits or give loans. You can't really do. Both I mean, you something. you can't take depo- deposit. Deposit taking and BFC license I haven't been given oh, for the last ten years or something. Oh, so okay. So therefore, um, doing something like this as a deposit taking and BFC is not possible. So now, now what happens is they say, let's do it through a quasi framework. They say, well, I am big fat startup, and therefore I will uh, you give me money. and i will make sure your money is lent it's a p2p framework so i'm yeah. only keeping the money temporarily while i give the money over to somebody else who's borrowing on my platform it's a p2p loan but you know what wink nod if something the other guy doesn't isn't able to repay i will repay it which i do believe by the way which you believe in the sense they say i don't have any reason to that these I mean, why would actually a, ruin the market no, by not doing yeah why would a successful startup who i want to create a great product not help you get your money yes no you know what if i am an nbfc yeah i'm looking at this and saying ek ek second i struggle i have to issue bonds i have to talk to banks to borrow money because i can't borrow from the retail public because you're not giving deposit taking yeah. nbfc license uh i have to do this but and when i do this then i can take the money and lend it to somebody else and whenever i lend it to somebody else you say you have to have capital adequacy ratio this that that this how come those rules doesn't apply to them because they are also offering a guarantee effectively it's their balance sheet that's securing the loans that they're giving that the, the deposits that they're taking uh, how come they don't get the same um, um uh, you know regulatory treatment and rbi is going to be like yes of course you how are you guaranteeing these loans i want every i want to analyze and if you if you have ever used the word guarantee no i'm sure they haven't they I'm haven't sure. i hope yeah. they haven't but even the impression that this is a guarantee is a bad thing Uh, according to me for the whole space because there is no real guarantee it's a quasi guarantee then it becomes a sahara and oh, sahara okay. was a big case where sahara took all this money little little money from a lot of people said it's a it's an investment they went and bought real estate in all sorts of places very liquid and when the time came to unwind all of this stuff um they simply did not have the liquidity to do so and they couldn't they, there was no capital buffers and all that so rbi and sebi were really really unhappy about this because there were a lot of private individuals whose money was stuck in 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 sahara and all of these cases and they said well you can't have this yes. you can't have a quasi bank quasi borrowing institution uh, which is uh, not regulated by rbi or sebi and uh, you know uh, there was a lot of jail time for the promoters and so on. so i think the new startups need to be cognizant of these rules and while you might think that there is a guarantee there's a risk that a regulator can come in tomorrow and say you can't run this operation even if there's an a sniff of a guarantee okay so you and it will hit the fan at some point so i feel it's all good you know in in the startup world uh when they're raising so much money every I mean, month you know they'll be able to the, the loan books are tiny compared yes, to the money loan books raising. are tiny compared to the money they're raising so i don't think they will ever default so uh or no, but your point is that this is not a scalable uh, operation and then regulators will get involved because this is uh, just not good for the system and you sense. know what like even the startup will guarantee the first maybe 1000 crores or 1500 crores but they can't do this for 30000 crores they don't have that kind of capital to guarantee it so at some point in time they're going to be guaranteeing more than they can afford and then, and then the point of fact fair enough so uh, i i get the sentiment with which you said this but so deepak this brings me to two questions then look uh, rbi won't let me make recurring card payments on my card anymore <laughs> so why have they then enabled this industry and and clearly seem to be encouraging this industry in some case and then you, you had second point which you had started to raise but we didn't get to which is 
then who should be here because you've cast such a i would say frankly negative look on the outlook on the whole thing that it says that if you get this is a bit like a lottery i mean if you're one of the lucky people who get 20% then good for you but by and large this has not been this super smooth great experience for everyone so who should be coming to a lending platform either as a lender or a borrower so both questions why is rbi encouraging the growth of this i mean wh- what's the policy or whatever objective they have and second who are the right people who should be coming here ah i think so from the first question which is rbi RBI, um, I think, has to recognize or has recognized the fact that RBI uh, rules apply. But you know what? People are going to lend money to each other anyhow, whether it's private. You know. So the difference is I have to know the person. I have to take collateral. I'll be a money lender. I'll be a serious. I'll do use bonded labor because that's the kind of people that do this on a money lending basis. Now, they said, listen, uh, why should people do this? You know what? There's a village. There's a farmer in a village who has to borrow from the local money lender simply because... Uh, there's no one else to borrow from. The banks won't touch these people. They don't have enough documentation and they can't speak the right language and they walk into a bank and people are not, well, yeah. not treated well. So at some point, there is no, um, there, there, there is a big problem um, uh, in, in, this, in this ecosystem for them to be able to get money. Now, me, Deepak Shana sitting in Bangalore looks at this and says, well, there are, you know what, there are farmers in Chhattisgarh who are suffering because of this. And it has been brought to my notice that the problem that they, they need only 30,000 rupees for a crop. You know what, I have 30,000. So I can help 30 farmers with 1,000 rupees each. And I know 30 other people who can do the same thing. Why don't we get together and give these farmers 1,000 rupees each per farmer, per person, and they all have uh, loans? Uh, RBI says, well, you know what, this is a good thing because you know what, banks and NBFCs are not doing their job. They're, they're the ones who should have been lending to these people in the first place. They're not. And there's a person like Deepak Shana who says, well, I'm happy to help them. Um, That's a key word. You've said help. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. The, the issue is this. I look at this and say, listen, if I give them money as charity, they're going to they're going to feel offended because they'll be like, I'm not begging for money, right? Uh, at the same time, um, I don't feel that they should be paying 30%, 40% and, you know, having their children bonded to the money lender simply because they, you know, so I am like, okay, let's do a much less usurious kind of a loan process and say, okay, maybe 8%. Uh, you know what? Worst case, don't pay me. I lose 30,000, I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm out of the 30 farmers, maybe five default, yeah, I'll get back only 25,000 rupees with some 8% interest. It's still less than what I paid. But you know what? For me, that's like, okay, if I lost that money, it's no big deal. Um, and some people have gotten helped and maybe they have managed to get their themselves a little bit out of poverty. Uh, and maybe the crop failed. So maybe 25 farmers out of the 30 didn't pay and only five paid. I'm still okay because I'm like, this was a situation out of their control. At least now they don't owe money lenders for the rest of their lives. This is more an act of quasi-charity. And there are startups in India that are doing uh, uh, stuff like this. That, Like for instance, there's Rangde.in where you can go and say, I want to um, help these farmers. And you can choose. I, I want to help them at a 0% interest rate or a 5% or a 7% or a 10%. However you choose to help the uh, uh, P2P player, this rung, they, uh, they actually kind of facilitate the loan. They make sure it gets it across and then they come back. So I have been a personal participant. I found it. I mean, I don't even bother to go check what it's doing. So, but what you're saying is it's not an asset class or an investment. I mean, this is almost a quasi-charity where you may make some of your money back and if you get very lucky, you'll make, you'll make money. Yes, but yeah, you know, here is where it gets a little complicated. Um, as long as it's this charity thing, it was good. Yeah. What if it suddenly becomes an investment? Now, I'll give you the example of microfinance. Um, microfinance and, and you know, the, there was Kolar and uh, Ramnagar, close cities close to Bangalore, and they have uh, specific mulberry silk that is grown in these places. So you get to breed silkworms, you, they grow into cocoons, and then the cocoons, the silk is extracted from the cocoons and silk uh, material is, is made. What happens when this process uh, takes place is that if you look at the uh, if you look at the situation is that somebody has to grow these silkworms into cocoons and kind of you know breed them and it is some all sorts of things that has to happen before they are processed. These are done by individual people. These individual people need money to breed those silkworms. They need loans. 
they took loans from micro finance. Micro finance companies says is great. You're breeding silk firms. Eventually, you're going to earn money. So you know what? You just need working capital, right? Just to be able to breed them. So why don't I give you money? Because what they were doing was borrowing from the factory owners, who the factories which were actually processing those. And silk those were too too expensive. Usurious, and they were like, you know, I'll give you an example of some of these loans. The loans, for instance, of fifty thousand rupee loan, you're supposed to repay it at ten thousand rupees per month. If you're not able to repay it, even if you're repaid thirty thousand rupees, he charges you interest on the full fifty thousand. It's, it's not a reducing yeah, balance; it's wrong. full balance. So they charge it, and and then there's a, pre, a non-payment penalty as well. So it is extremely usurious these loans. So now. Um, you could the microfinance player said you know i won't give you that kind of a serious loans but i'll give you 30% per year kind of a serious loans less step serious up. but step you know up. step up substantial step up and um, uh, you pay me back uh, over a period of 6 months and you know uh, do this all fine first cycle everybody does this um three other microfinance players enter the free Why seeing a business opportunity? Seeing a business opportunity because they're saying, listen, great microfinance. Thirty percent money. And you yeah, know what? What yeah. we're saying is they're all work together. Okay, so they they're a community. I lend money to this community. If anybody defaults, I shame them in a monthly meeting. Okay. And because of you, I'm going to penalize the whole group by adding one rupee fine for it. Sure. You know, so then you you feel miserable, and then you somehow find a way to pay it back. Uh, this uh, is 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 an interesting model. It kind of starts to work. But what's important over here is. that these other players want to get into the same communities that have been lent to uh, by other microfinance companies they say why don't you you know what uh, take a loan from me also you can use it you know grow more silk firms and the guy says you know what my daughter's marriage is coming and i don't have enough money i was going to the money lender to borrow money but you know what this guy wants to give me money to breed silk firms but maybe i'll breed some more silk firms but let me take the money and finish my daughter's marriage first This is not a problem. This is naturally. This is life. This is how life is. Now, uh, this is a second loan. This is the second loan. He's taken the second loan. He's taking because there's money coming in, yeah, they're, yeah, okay. and they're pushing this money down your throat. They're literally asking you, "Isn't there any way you can use the money?" And you know you have ways to use the money, so you you kind of take it and you use it, and then now time has come for repayment. Uh, you say, "Well, you know what? I have access to money. I'll go to the third NBFC uh, microfinance company, take some money, and pay it back." Uh, after some time everybody has multiple loans everybody uh, uh, the microfinance guys haven't talked to each other and uh, you don't know how many uh, loans each person has uh, and uh, soon it starts to you start to realize that everybody in this community is extremely over uh, leveraged, uh, leveraged. Guess, yeah. uh, at the same time uh, and what happened in kolar and uh, this thing was that the community community entire community of these areas which are growing the silk worms they started to feel the pinch and said listen now i'm going to every silkworm i breed i the money i get from it i have to pay as interest i don't have any money left for myself because the interest rates are high and also that you know i have been burdened by more loans plus they are not very educated somebody comes and tells them use this money they feel like ha huh, he's why not kind of well in fairness interest rates and compounding are very non intuitive so half the time i don't know what's going on either exactly. i get what you mean it's yeah. not it's not easy for anybody to figure it out and so, so the, because of the partial misselling as well this kind of what has what happened over there was that the community leaders in those uh, specific areas said you guys are getting overburdened because these people have given you more loans and forced them down your throats don't repay and mass and mass so and it may have been triggered by maybe a suicide that happened unfortunately by no, one, or it, suicide yeah. attempt that happened by some people and all that stuff so how what happens because of this is suddenly on mass everybody says listen i am not supposed to repay because our leaders have said don't repay we will not repay so when you when they did that it happened in kolar and uh, ramnagar closer to bangalore but it happened in the entire state of andhra where the political establishment says don't repay got uh, rbi was unhappy about that but coming back to what happened in this case was uh, when you've got a system of extreme leveraging in the and the and there is a propensity to say i won't repay now what are you going to do for instance you can't go your idea was i'll call a community meeting and i'll shame one person who defaulted now are you going to shame 30 people well i don't think it'll end very well yeah, for I you mean, i mean yeah. there is the threat of physical violence over yeah. here but beyond that everybody's going to laugh at you and say what shame we're all defaulters we we're not going to return i mean we've been told not to return your money plus it's your fault because you shoved these loans down our now think of this happening in p2p as well it may not be the same way but you 
create a situation where at the extreme there are defaults and the defaults are on mass. So you go to a village, you have done a loan in a village, the crop has failed in that entire village because guess what? There were unseasonal rains that suddenly happened and that, in that sudden rain, everybody's crop got wiped off. What are you going to do? You can't go to them and say, give me back. I mean, I'll now a typical microfinance company will be like, listen, guys, I'll give you another year. Don't worry. But microfinance company is a company. So they have that ability. Now you've you've got loans from 40 or 50 or 100 people. Are you going to get each one of those 100 people to say, it's okay, we can wait another year? And now it's difficult because one of those 100 will be like, no, I don't want to wait another year. I don't care. You please recover, send a legal notice. This becomes a problem in the P2P framework where when there is a default, and especially if the default is systemic in nature in the sense it is, it is not just one individual, but it has affected a community as a whole, you've created a situation where these uh, uh, where the people cannot return their money and uh, the borrowers are not organized enough to make a, a quick concession. Collect, collective decision to give a concession to the to the so this is where i think you may have a problem uh, so you should be careful about what your objective is and if your objective was to make it an investment then it's a lot more work it's a business by itself and Worst thing is you can't even create a business out of it. If you make it a company, then P2P is not even allowed as a company. So you're finished. So And that's when you could have claimed the loss. Actually. That's when you should have claimed the loss. And it's, it's really unfortunate. I get it. Um, so actually, you hit on that point you were saying about overlending reminded me of the US financial crisis. With, I mean, a lot of loans were given... I don't know, I guess just chasing yield or just because expanding balance sheets and whatever. Yeah, was, and then, I mean, ninjas at that time, no income, job or assets and they were getting loans. Uh, so you got, uh, you here. And you could take a, a pe- double or a second mortgage on, uh, double or triple mortgage on the house. Or on something. the same house. And you know what, in India also you've had situations where uh, usurious loans made by apps apparently owned by Chinese people who uh, created these yeah. uh, and you know we've no, no, seen I've seen, this, we've in, seen this, this first hand yeah. I mean and uh, you, you've seen the apps get recycled a uh, 1 lakh uh, debt tri- what was it it, it four became 4 lakhs, lakhs in, yeah. in like a month yes and then uh, at this point it was like we didn't know yeah, what to do and, and you know what the person remember we talked to the person and they said they want to repay yeah. even though it was an usurious loan we said don't repay default voluntarily on this because this is just nonsense uh, they actually wanted to borrow money to be able to repay that loan because they didn't want that feeling that they have not repaid a loan on their chest. So this is actually where... So this is actually really complicated because you look at it, I mean, where I was originally going with this conversation is, say, banks and NBFC's existing players have, have not lent enough, so we need more players out there to expand the lending. But then you've also pointed out when you expand lending, sometimes there's over lending and then there's over borrowing. Uh, to be honest, loans just sound like a very, very hard business for everyone involved. So I think in in general, a loan, any company that makes a loan has to have a mentality that says some of these loans are going to go bad by design, by by nature. Humans as individuals, especially a lot of people in India that I've seen, are not built to handle a thought process like this. If you buy 50 plots of land, you have enough money to buy 50 plots of land. Yeah, sure. One of them... Um, uh, gets, I don't know, encroached by somebody else. One out of 50. Uh, My thought process over here is, let it go. It doesn't matter, you have another 49 and, you know, you'll make enough money on them. You'll make, because, I mean, going there, dealing with maybe some unsavory elements or um, uh, uh, running a thought process may not even be worth the time you spend on it. It may be a really far off thing and all that stuff. And especially, and look at the context of P2P lending. You have maybe a thousand rupees per person. Um, you have to be able to make enough loans and say, you know what, one or two thousand I will lose. That's the kind of man. Now, a lot of people don't have this. I'm, I'm not saying 100%, but let's say 80% of the people that I know who want to make money do not it want to make will not take this probabilistic, probability-based thing, I mean, basically. They, they're like, every rupee you lose. and whether, Stings. You know, it stings. And they want to be like, at least I should have tried to recover this money. And you know what? It's more effort to recover a thousand rupees than it looks and you know although the person on the other side may be laughing and saying i took your thousand i didn't give it back to you what can you do about it uh you're like i choose not to do anything about it because that's not my business model at all because most people are honest and uh, you're one of the few dishonest people i'll just try to find a way to avoid you in the future people just don't have that thought process in their mind so that's another reason why p2p lenders um 
that means people like me who want to who have enough money who want to put money in trust frameworks will find it difficult to deal with the complexity and the high default rates of uh, such uh, you know kind of ventures um the lenders on the other side are fine because what i'll tell you why, why they are doing this is because they can earn this spread without having any of their own capital at risk and that spread is 2% or nothing now you know in effect this is a good business if the business model itself was sound but these p2p platforms are like this they going to the borrowers and saying don't worry these people won't default they going to the uh, sorry the lenders yeah. they going to the borrowers and saying listen come here you're not getting a loan anywhere else i'll find people to give you the loans so you're encouraging bad thought process from both sides rather than going to the lenders and saying if you lend here you might actually be doing favor to this community which i think is a good way to kind of address it um the other thought process that i can think of and you know a, a, a friend told me about this model that was running in gawahati where they went to a shopkeeper and they lent them 1 lakh rupees for working capital and every day for a year they told them we will come every day you have to give us back 500 rupees now the math here is ridiculous because you are returning 500 rupees a day so your principal you are actually paying off principal every yeah, day and the and the rule of thumb is that if you pay for 11 months the 12th month is free so everybody wants to pay for that 11 months you think of it 11 months is about 330 days 330 days into 500 is 1.6 uh, lakhs 1. so 6, if, 5, yeah. if i if i paid 1 lakh if i give a loan of 1 lakh and i'm getting 1.6 and that too not all of it at the end every day i'm getting 500 you rupees you you're making a very high return it's like 200 plus or 100 200% plus return uh that is the return that uh, makes a lot of sense to continuously uh, uh, have as a microfinance platform sure. and unfortunately of course it may not be allowed for microfinance yeah, i would think it's not right i mean they have to but i think p2p you might still be able to i mean i think that's what makes sense because you know what at 100% d at 100% interest rate apr the default rates can be as high as 30 it's okay Uh, because you can still make you know uh, for instance uh, for a, if i only if i have a 50% default rate does a 100% yeah. you know kind of you. break yeah. even so so I, as long as uh, my default rates are high i should be able to charge a much higher loan so i have to package it in a way that doesn't look very high but 500 rupees for per day for a loan that's 1 lakh rupee upfront sounds like acha theek hai reasonable well, i have to be honest it does sound reasonably compelling to me because you're discharging some of your obligation every day but i know how the math works and so yeah, yeah i see I mean, from a, that said it might be in a sense a very safe method for both, for me to be able to repay my loan I mean. uh, it might actually and yeah. many of the shopkeepers actually have the cash and they prefer to pay every day so for instance you collect the cash in, on the day and then the uh, one guy comes to your shop at the end of the day sir my 500 you give him a 500 rupee and you're note, done kind of and you're done so as long as you're in this process of continuously repaying that money every day you don't feel the pinch and uh, you've got the capital to finance your shop in the first place yeah you did pay whatever 100 plus percent but i i, I vaguely understand what you mean by so in a sense uh, what i'm hearing from you is that there's two use cases which really would thrive under like new and innovative learning uh, lending frameworks there's the extremely high interest rate in these interesting models and then there's the quasi charity kind of one but in the middle it's difficult and that's what i hear yeah because in the middle you're sitting and you know what 6% is not going to excite you 7% is not going to excite you anything above 7 you're getting the guy who does not have collateral or does not have this so it's a it's a hit and a miss and your thought process is always like i hate to lose money and now you're always going to be under this misery of listen if i had maybe filed a police complaint if i had sent a lawyer's notice maybe i would have got back some other money that thing is just like i mean why would you do something that makes you hate yourself um, at night uh, so at best you should think of it as charity and invest so much amount that you're completely willing to lose 100% and give it for charitable purposes so give it to people who are in such bad shape they can't afford anything um, um, else so i think that makes sense so deepak thank you very much for that that's a very sobering take on p2p lending and let's see how the ecosystem evolves because the players in this space they're well funded they're certainly very thoughtful about it so let's see what they do next so i'm willing to wrap it up uh, and uh, so thanks so much everyone thank you deepak uh, thanks everyone for listening uh, if you want to listen to more episodes go to capitalmind.in/podcast while you're on the site you'll see content from our do it yourself research business called capital mind premium and if you're interested in us having um, to manage your money and then look up our portfolio management service capital mind wealth where is a registered pms and we manage uh, money of 50 lakhs and above 
If you've listened to us up to this point, then you can use the code CM podcast for a 15% discount on Capital Mind Premium. Uh, and as always, Deepak is at Deepak Shinoy on Twitter and Capital Mind is at Capital Mind underscore in. Thanks, Shrey. This was awesome. And thanks everyone for listening in. Uh, looking forward to great new episodes, a lot of new stuff. Please get in touch and uh, have a happy, happy festive season. Happy festive season.